We did that last year for the first time. Yeah, I think they really liked good. it. The parents, it felt much more formal or whatever. Yeah. But I don't want you messing with your graduation stuff. Just kind of. Believe me, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't think it was a problem. Hang on. Sorry. J K. Yeah. I guess last year they were in the high school. In the NPR. Yeah. yeah. Well, because like all of our chairs and then everything gets sent there for your graduation. Oh, sure. When is it? Well, they want to have it Friday the thirty first. Let's call this to order then at six o'clock. Thank you all for coming this evening. So just if you could please take a quick look at the protocols. Pop up that little gem thing, maybe, maybe not. Together we engage, educate, and empower all learners, bridging their passions, pathways to create successful futures and positively contribute to our local and global communities. I didn't get any little red cards, which is good. Catherine said she'll be joining us at 6.30, so I'm wondering, we should ask maybe um, if she would like an adjustment to the start time while she's got this conflict. If that's all right with everyone, we'll ask her once she arrives after. She'll be fine with us staying at 6. Yeah, I suspect so. <laughs> I don't think this lasts that long. All right, we'll move right on to item four then, the athletics and activity budget presentation, please. Unless, uh, George, are you okay with all this order? Are you okay with that? Please? I'll go after because <laughs> there may be some questions when these guys get done too. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. All right. So, Trent, it's your floor. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> um. Yours and Dave's, right? <clears throat> yeah, not me. <laughs> um. So obviously with our department, we oversee athletics, activities, and clubs, the three different areas that we would break that down into. Um, our athletics are overseen by the WIA, the Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association. Uh, we're a member of the Middle Border Conference, except for girls hockey. We are not a member of a conference for girls hockey because the Middle Border does not um, have enough schools that participate in hockey. I guess in theory, everybody's in our co-op for the most part, other than Baldwin and St. Croix Central. So they do not have a conference uh, sport for girls hockey, so we're considered an independent. Um, I've listed on the presentation all of the athletic teams that we offer that are part of the WIAA. Um, and then in parentheses, those are our participation numbers. That's how many kids participated this school year um, in each of those sports. Trent, are the nine girls all are those nine all from Somerset? Great question, yeah. So for both hockey and for boys and girls, those are the number of kids that are from Somerset. When we report out to the WIA, we only report on our kids. Oh. The other co-op schools, they report on their kids back to them. So that's the Somerset kids that are in there. Yeah. Look at track. Yeah. yeah, I would, just this spring across the board, I know baseball is up. Boys golf, according to Todd, they were up this year also. Girls soccer is doing very well. Softball's fairly comparable to last year. And then track overall. Um, on the girls side, we haven't had over 20 girls in our track program in the last five years. So That's yeah, great. our spring numbers right now are, are doing pretty, pretty well. Um, our activities that we offer, cheer dance, destination imagination. We do a drama in the spring, our dynamics, team. Um, we have forensics, mock trial. We have a musical that we do typically in the fall. Um, National Honor Society, robotics, and student council. This year with our drama and uh, musical productions, uh, Mrs. Pelbicki is our musical coordinator. She was out on maternity leave, so we did a drama performance <coughs> in the fall, and we also did one in the spring. So next year it'll go back to um, having it musical in the fall and then a drama performance in the spring. So that, those are our participation numbers um, that are for act, our activities. For our clubs, I didn't list all of our clubs. Um, you know, we have quite a variety of them. Um, you know, we have ski club, we have an art club that meets, we had a writing club that started up and, you know, met from time to time this year. Um, and then we also have a fishing team that, that meets as well. So participation numbers for some of those are, are more concrete than others. Um, and some meet more regularly than others. So um, I did not include a slide for that, but we do have a lengthy list of clubs as well. The difference you know, between our activities and our clubs for the most part, um, 
Our clubs don't rely on us financially to support for funding um, supplies or different things with that as well. So um, at the middle school level, we offer a variety of athletics cross country for both boys and girls, football, volleyball, basketball for both boys and girls, <coughs> wrestling, and then track for both boys and girls. That's our only spring um, athletic team that we have run here at Somerset. And then we have three different official activities at the middle school level, Destination Imagination. We do a drama performance in the spring. And then this year we had um, Math Counts and Math Masters who was here at our last board meeting to get recognized for their accomplishments this year. Um, I do not include the participation numbers for middle school um, on this presentation that is all stuff that we have easily accessible. If you want that, we can put that in one of our weekly board updates that we send out every, every weekend. Um, kind of what that means for the, the overall budget. Um, our overall budget for this year uh, was slotted at um, 145710 um, Kind of what a breakdown is for each level. So athletics and activities at the high school level, middle school athletics and middle school activities, you can see the percentages that are, are listed there as far as what that makes up over our, of our overall budget. That number, that's more, that's our supplies, our entry fees, our officials, our game workers, all those. That doesn't include our coaching salaries or our transportation pieces into that. Um, I can easily get those numbers for you, but for this purpose of this presentation, though, that's our general operating with supplies and kind of what makes them, makes them go from that standpoint. Should be noted that that's less than 1% of our overall district budget. So I guess even if you threw the coaching salaries in there, that still would be such a small percentage of our district's $18 million budget. Do the coaching and uh, transportation, they do, do they come out of your budget or is it quoted differently anyway? Dave? Was that? I believe they're quoted, quoted different. So it doesn't come The transportation and the bus? Or would they fall Mostly uh, that's different, yeah. Um, kind of a breakdown of what that budget looks like overall then um, the top two parts of that the personnel services and entry fees those are things that we in order to run our programs those are our costs that we have to encounter if we're playing a basketball game or hosting a wrestling duel you're gonna have officials there's no way around that you can't go out and necessarily shop around for those types of things, those are things that costs that are going to be a part of operating our our activities and our programs here. Um, so our personnel services, our officials fees, those are mainly set by the Middle Border Conference. Um, overall, the different services that we have to, to do things like every year for wrestling, we have to have our scale recertified. Um, and then game workers, which is, is relatively new for us. And then the other part of that are our entry fees. We have to pay membership dues to the Middle Border Conference. Anytime we're in a tournament, um, you know, wrestling, cross country, track, those are the most common ones that you have to pay entry fees for the tournaments. Um, anytime we send a team to state, whether they're WIA sports or like our cheer and dance teams, when we send them to state, that costs money for us to send teams there. Um, coaching clinics and then Within the last, I think it's within the last five years, the WIA now requires that each paid coach for WIA sports is first aid and CPR trained. So we have to pay someone to, somebody to train those coaches, and then we also have to pay for their um, certifications. And then the, the bottom part of that is our, some of our discretionary funds, stuff that we can rotate around and, and do as needed, supplies, equipment, and, and uniforms. Um, and then the final part there is our, our revenue our gate that we get for football, volleyball, basketball, and wrestling, those are the sports that we charge for, charge admission for. We do not charge admission at baseball, cross country, golf, soccer, and softball. That's pretty standard across most conferences, most schools. Um, this year, or actually, sorry, last winter, I think it started where students now get into games for free. So if you were to look at what our revenue was last year for our gate compared to this year, especially in the fall sports, you would see a noticeable decrease in, in just revenue gate, but a large part of that is we don't charge students anymore. Um, and then hockey, the admissions handled by the rink, but then they keep that. Um, that's kind of the way that they've always done it. Part of that's with ice time and um, different facility things. 
revenue, other sources of revenue that we have, entry fees. If we host, you know, we host a cross country meet in the fall, we receive entry fees from other schools. Part of that offset, offsets our cost to run the operation with the timer and workers and um, officials. We have registration fees, you know, for activities that we charge our students to participate. Different programs do fundraisers. Um, in parentheses, I put class community. That's something that we're trying to use across the district where it just kind of streamlines the process. It's supposed to be a place where um, people can go and see all the fundraisers that are out there and available and provide people more information. Um, we get donations all the time from different people. Um, and then we get reimbursed for different things, such as if we send a team or an individual to WIA State. This last fall, we sent a golfer, girls golfer, to State down in Madison. We recoup some costs, obviously not everything, but we recoup some of those costs when we send somebody to WIA State. Um, and they set the rates that we get reimbursed for travel. Um, in some sports, you get reimbursed for hotel and lodging, and then they do reimburse you for some of their meals as well. With our hockey co-op, um, we build the other schools based on the number of kids that participate. And then another example that I had for the reimbursements was robotics. Um, Mr. Olson had worked on a grant that we do get some reimbursement back from, from DPI. They have a grant that's available for that as well. And then the last um, source of revenue that comes up here is when we host WIA tournaments, we do get um, a percentage of that gate or they have a funding formula <coughs> that we get some back for that. So like this fall, last fall, we hosted a home playoff football game. That's a pretty good revenue stream for us coming back in because the gate gets factored into that. So um, when we hosted that this last winter, we, hold, we had the opportunity to host a home boys basketball game um, that we played in, so we get part of that. We actually had a sectional game fall into our lap this year where one of the schools that was supposed to be hosting a sectional game was playing in the game. So we were kind of proactively looking ahead to see that that was a scenario. We reached out to the WIA and said, hey, if this scenario unfolds we, and you need a neutral site, we'd be willing to host. Um, and that team ended up winning, so we were able to host a girls sectional game um, here this past winter. And I did find out today, actually, <coughs> next fall, we had put in for a volleyball sectional and we were granted a sectional semi for volleyball next fall so we'll be hosting that so yeah great any questions i have a couple um, i'm so appreciative that you reach out for those sectional meets the along that line um you you noted that this is new for us to have game workers or paying fees for game workers and that was something that our our district took pride in previously mm -hmm. that we had so many volunteers is there some way we can help you go back to that volunteer because I think it also creates a feeling of being a part of it. So I'd like to see us keep encouraging that. I think there's no shortage of opportunity to serve and that's a great one. Parents involved helps you get to know each other, the other parents as well. So that was what I appreciated about it, what I had kids involved. I don't know if the others of you felt that way. Did you like it that your folks were part of the ticket selling and concession selling? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's good. Uh, the, the reason we went back, went to this, is it was getting harder and harder to find yeah. people to volunteer. You just don't have the right people asking, I and, think. And that's probably, <laughs> probably you know. Because the invitation is what makes the difference. And if you get a group of people started on getting that going, I think it's a wonderful way of building the community, too, and communications with the community. Now, there's a lot of different groups out there that I know the scholarship fund really appreciates getting those dollars from the Ticket sales combined with the scholarship fund. You know that too, probably, Lori. Mm -hmm. It's it's just an opportunity that I think we should maybe explore more. And even if we started with just one sport event, I, I'd like to see us encourage that. Service is a big deal. We should be encouraging that. That's my take on it. Uh, the, the other question I had, we were paying soccer admission, but I see it's noted here, and you had said you're not charging admission anymore? Mm -hmm. Okay. So a couple years ago, maybe that was just a... I know if it's a playoff game, we have to charge, but home games, I know we didn't charge last year. Maybe it was fall. a playoff. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Playoff games, we have to. <laughs> there were big signs up, I think, last year when we had to do the one playoff game. Yeah. Okay. And even, charge. And okay. even like when we host a <coughs> playoff game, like when we host the playoff football game and basketball game, typically our students get in for free. When it comes to tournament time, we have to charge everybody that comes through then. Yeah. yeah. And I, I did leave out 
earlier, we are hosting a sectional semi or sorry, a sectional final game for girls soccer in the spring. Oh, so that's the game good. to go to state. So hopefully we're playing in it. That'd be awesome. But yeah, we'll, we'll see good. what happens. So then do we get to host it? Maybe not. Up to the offices in Stevens Point. They got <coughs> Thank you. Those yeah. are my that the money that we take in in revenue here, how is how is that quoted and used? Does that go back to the athletic budget, or does it go back into the general fund, or how does that yeah. work? Dave, I believe that goes to the general fund, correct? Yeah, gate, gate fees, activity fees, all that is general fund revenue. So even though you have to take the money out to pay the workers, you can't offset that with what you take in. Well, kind of All the way here, you can. Part of the, well, it's as part of the general fund, too, because those dollars make that athletic budget. Yeah. Is that what you meant? Well, yeah. I more directly. All right. So, athletics and some activities um, generate revenue. All the revenues go into our, our general fund pot, and we split up what revenues we have. And sometimes um, we're deficit spending additional funds from fund balance or what have you to pay for everything that we do. Okay. So, so you all the revenues generated might not necessarily pay for a program, uh -huh. um, but they contribute to the, the total pool. Right. Okay. So when we were asking for the new proposed, not weight training, uh, not so bigger, faster, stronger. Yeah. <laughs> yes. When we were asking if that could be part of the curriculum, it would just be coming out of a different budget. Well, I think that um, they had a plan for that, where they were looking at specific funding sources to specifically pay for it. Sometimes things like um, the Fab Lab grant, for instance, or other grants, where it's a one time where um, maybe it's the start of a new thing. Um, if we know we're getting revenue for some purpose, we say, okay, that revenue still goes into the general fund, into the pool of money, but we say we're going to increase the expenditure budget yeah. for that particular program because of that revenue that will be coming back to offset. Great. So if you need some help in figuring out how to do that volunteer thing, I'll have can I just, if you don't mind, can I just make a comment about that too? Because I think the last couple of years, um, with the volunteering thing, to kind of reiterate what Dr. Buzik was saying too, we found that putting some payment behind it, especially for certain positions, and we're looking at varsity positions, uh, running a football clock, now running our scoreboards, those kinds of things, has increased the likelihood that we're going to have somebody there consistently. I think with some of the volunteering things, um, this is a general statement, but we were finding over the last couple of years that you know we have a, let's say a middle school football game and um, for some reason something came up, two of our volunteers that we plan on being there weren't there. We're pulling a dad out of the stands that maybe isn't trained or knowledgeable necessarily in how to do the flight, you know, all those kinds of things. So I think, and I was having to speak for you, but from our perspective, being able to put a little bit of formality behind it has helped ensure that we have consistent people there and the right people doing some of those really specific positions. So. I think that's just legitimate, to, but I don't think it can take the place of encouraging service. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get parents that have done it for years once they're invited. So sometimes it's just a matter of setting in the process, putting together the program again, because it kind of fell apart, and reestablishing it. And you'll have consistency, but because it kind of got lost, I don't think parents were asked. I, I, I know that's how it happened before. It wasn't easy. Nothing good ever is, but if it's worth it, and I believe it is, we can put it in place. Mm -hmm. And I, I would encourage it. Get people involved. You'll get better support. I think. Am I the only one that feels that way? Maybe I am. I see the point. I see the. I'm. I was one of the dads that got pulled into doing the change game Thank because you. somebody <laughs> and I wanted to. I didn't know how to run it, so I was kind of like, no. But you may do. Uh, Don't yeah. put me on the clock because I watch the <laughs> no. game and I get distracted. <laughs> Don't, I'm not saying I'm on the clock. That was the purpose of me going to watch that, though. So yeah. the parents yeah. was like, okay, no, I'm, I'm roped into working. So. 
Well, the WAA is actually encouraging schools to move away from having parents do those kinds of things. Not that it can't still be volunteer type things, but yeah. because of issues over the course of time that occur when you have mom running the clock on oh, a yeah, varsity game, you know, that kind of stuff. So <laughs> those are conversations we've had. It's just really about getting the right people in there. And I see your point of the paid versus not paid, the volunteering thing. So certainly something we can take a look at. I, I'd love to sit in on it because I really think, even though we don't have a lot of time, sometimes all it takes is asking someone. It's just a matter of, there's definitely some people that we shouldn't have at the clock. <laughs> but there's others that would probably enjoy that. Mm -hmm. I hear it from a lot of parents, from our kids who've all graduated, God, I never am at the school for anything anymore. And sometimes it's just a matter of, hey, I'm glad they asked me. That's it. So, and if I'm wrong, I will learn it in short order, won't I? <laughs> they make themselves heard. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for you? If not, I should go back to a roll call. <laughs> <laughs> kind of hopped right over there. Bruce Blarton. Here. Katie Thermos. Marie Kolba. Here. Bob Gunther. Here. Courtney Krakowski. Catherine Cranston. Lori Blarton. Here. And Catherine did say she'll be coming in at 6.30. I'm not sure if all you want that on there. All right, so now we're back to um, building level budget presentation on I-5. So. Who wants to start? <laughs> oh, that's me. I drew the short straw. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, you did such a good job last year. Well, thank you. You know, I'll just, yep. So, <laughs> so on slide two there, when, when we're talking about a building budget, we work out of two main areas, Fund 10, the general fund, and then Fund 21, which is our activity accounts and our rollover accounts. Uh, so each of us will talk a little more specifically about our Fund 10 accounts. Um, and those are mostly classroom budgets, building supplies, office type supplies, um, copy machine maintenance, paper. Um, com each building has a common school fund and you'll see the breakdown um, for what each building gets. That's a, a state allotment for our media centers. Um, and then building maintenance. Those are the biggest areas um, that, that we use out of the general fund. Um, we don't touch salaries or any of that kind of stuff. This is all just things that basically impact um, teachers and kids. Um, and then our Fund 21s are the ones that roll over our activity accounts. So our student council, they do fundraisers or they're spending money that's rolling in so they can keep, um, you know, if they have a balance at the end of the year, they have access to it over the summer and then the following year. Um, some grade levels, um, particularly more at the high school level where you've got like your freshman class, your sophomore class who are raising money toward that, that senior piece, they're going to have it. Um, I, there's a couple of grade levels in my building that have some reward based um, Fund 21 accounts. Um, each of us principals have a principal activities account, and that is funded through our um, drink machines. So when the kids purchase water and juice and that kind of stuff, it goes into that where we're able to then support um, you know, student rewards, um, some all school um, celebrations, those sorts of things. Additionally, if a teacher applies for a grant and receives it. So a couple of years ago, I had a teacher who applied for a grant through the um, and received an arts fund grant that would funded the cost of a camera and a Chromebook and some other pieces for a project that he was working on. Instead of setting up another line item in a Fund 21, that gets rolled into the principal's activity account. And then we just talk and I work with the teacher and the business office as far as, okay, so this is the receipt for the purchase that I made. This comes out of the principal's account and we just keep, keep it con conversational that way. Um, when I first went in and looked at our Fund 21s, I don't know, Dave, what were there, like 15, 17? It was just a ridiculous amount. Some that hadn't been touched in like eight or nine years. And so we cleaned it up, and I think, like in my building in particular, we're down to like eight, which is extremely manageable when you're looking and talking about funds rolling from year to year. Um, and so I haven't added a, a budget one, and I probably have another one that I could get rid of in my building if I'm just speaking about that, that, that hasn't been touched in a couple of years. So. It's been really helpful, but that's the monies that come in, go out, and then it can roll from year to year. So, did you say the principal's fund is funded by the drinks, or the grade level funds is funded by the uh, drinks? principal? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and as far as so specific to the middle school, um, the total budget for the middle school and out of um, Fund 10 is $121,933. So less than 1% of 
I can just say that based on what Trent's numbers were, so less than that even of our entire overall budget. Um, we set classroom budgets, we're just getting ready as soon as Dave gives us the green light. We set those in the spring so teachers are aware of what they have. Um, for this 18-19 year, it was just over $33,000 for um, classroom budgets. That gets shared with teachers in the spring so that they are aware of um, if they want to do any ordering in the spring to be ready for the fall. But then the nice piece that they have is they can order pretty much as they need throughout the school year um, up until this coming Friday. Um, so they don't have to try to spend all of their money in one fell swoop. They can use it as they need it over the course of a year. That's for all your teachers? Though. All of my teachers. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, then Common School Fund makes up over $16,000 of the 121. Uh, that is what um, my media specialist manages. Uh, that's purchasing books and media um, for use in our library, and that's um, from the state. Then my principal account for Office of the Principals um, allocated as $30,000. Out of that, I use student rewards, I'm bringing in guest speakers, um, additional classroom support. There are some times where teachers need something additional that they're working on, whether it be for a project or they want to try a new unit, and they don't have the funds in their classroom budget to do it, so they'll come to me and we'll work together to try to make something like that work. Um, strategic plan execution. So, for example, we bring in the Courage Retreat each year, which is a part of our work. So if there's something big that needs to come out of that, I will work to support that. And then any other middle school needs that may arise, office supplies, staff rewards, um, all of my students have an agenda that comes out of that, that budget, um, out of my office account. And uh, then the last piece, the last area is building maintenance. So George and I work together to plan for updates, new furnishings, if we're going to paint, if we're going to replace carpet. Um, this year I purchased some lunchroom tables because we were short on some space. So just lots of, you know, anything that has to do with building maintenance, George and I work together um, for that. Some of, I believe, his travel costs are also coded under that since he is mainly housed out of my building. So if he attends a, a professional development, that comes out of that piece as well. So that's how my budget gets split out. Any questions? All right, I feel like I should say ditto. 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 <laughs> my numbers look a little bit different, but you kind of get the same idea. So um, just a couple things to note. So. Um, my budget for teachers is split out by department, um, and that was by their request. So English department gets a certain amount, math department, social studies department, um, which has led to some really good discussions within teams in terms of how they want to use that money to most, you know, to have the biggest impact on instruction. Um, Common school fund, uh, same exact explanation that Sarah gave in terms of how we use that. Um, in the high school, I would say we've moved away over the last probably two or three years of. Um, really using the bulk of that on books. It's a lot of online subscriptions, um, Kindles, those kinds of things, because kids just by the nature of kids in 2019 aren't checking out books at the same rate as they were you know, 10 years ago. Um, and so trying to find some other uh, means for kids to be able to still engaging in text, but in a way that is more relevant to how they function now. Um, off to the principal, again, same, the same idea as Sarah, guest speakers, um, graduation is a a fairly hefty bill in the high school, a um, lot of items for that to take care of that each year. Our celebration of excellence, um, celebration that we have at the end of the year. Um, strategic plan, you know, one big thing that I've spent some money on the last two years is some flexible seating around the building. So our high top tables and chairs that we put around um, to be able to have kids use those during their flex time. Um, and then building maintenance, for example, last year we recarpeted a wide variety of classrooms. Um, Again, we've been in discussion about some different things to be able to do with that. A lot of that's been on hold a little bit, just waiting to see what the referendum's going to do and you know, before we make any big decisions about what to do with some of that money. So um, I, too, am still kind of in the process a little bit of cleaning up some old line items that likely don't need to be there anymore. For example, I just ran across one the other day for driver's ed. Um, it's been quite some time. I couldn't even give you how many years it's been since we've functioned driver's ed through the high school. So. Um, a couple of pieces there that we're still working on, kind of making that as clean as possible, but for the most part, there's kind of your the big overview. Hey, Catherine, thanks for coming. Any questions for Shannon or Sarah? And last but not least, thank you. 
So the elementary school specific budget, same type of thing with the teacher budget set in the spring, um, $34,090. Each teacher is very much in charge of everything, which was, which was new learning for me from everything from their staples to their pencils to their everything they plan and get for their classrooms. Um, so they have to be pretty thoughtful throughout the year so that they have things you know, as they need them. Um, Office of the Principal, 29,000. Again, student, we do a student of the month um, classroom of the month, the classroom of the month gets to do, they get to do a kind of a party type of thing, um, incentives for that, additional classroom support as well, office furnishings, same kinds of things you've heard, chairs, copy machines, um, other op elementary needs, school supplies, any school-wide celebration we're doing. Um, our common school funds is 22643 and our building maintenance is 48850 to get us to that. Similar line items, and, and as, as they both were saying, I'm just kind of learning what's what and where it is and, and those kinds of things, but um, that's that. Questions that you Is had? it similar to last year? I don't have anything else here. It is. Mm -hmm. What would be an example of something that might change those dramatically? If we wanted to cut percentage across the board I think okay maybe eight or nine years ago we said 10% cut across the board um, at the same time you know it's not a huge percentage of the fund 10 budget right. um, when they talk about budgets for their teachers their departments what have you um, that's that's at each principal's discretion so um, if there's a new bunch of new teachers or some mm -hmm prerogative within the building, they can reallocate funds uh, as they see fit, and they also use their office budgets for different programs, different initiatives uh, that may come up. Uh, I think Shannon mentioned she may also use it sometimes to supplement some of the building maintenance type stuff. If she and George and Brian have already spent a lot of that money and she wants to do something else, some additional carpet or what have you, she can use some of her office funds if she has that. So Teachers have to have budgets to run their, their courses, um, but I would say a large part of this is at the principal's discretion. Any other questions? At the middle school, though, when we had a substantial cut to the budgets, I think when I first started, our my classroom budget was like $900 or something like that, and I think my last year it was like and it was 25 years later. So mm -hmm. substantial cut. And in some classes, like science, for example, there are greater expenses mm -hmm. for experiments and things like that. And uh, Sarah would allow teachers to uh, work together. So if I had a little extra money in my <coughs> budget, I could lend it or give it to Damon in the science department to buy some supplies. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. having that flexibility is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's still in place. Yeah. And the awareness too. Mm -hmm. you know, the, which budgets are impacted by not having that out. Thank you. All right, so if there are no other questions there, we will move on to the blue, thank you all very much for doing that. The blue ribbon cleaning service update on item six. And George. I'm on. Overall, uh, the blue ribbon cleaning has been a great change for us. Uh, we're really happy to have the smaller contractor. We opted for that back in September, and the smaller contractor has stepped up to the plate. Uh, they continue to be invested in our district and they're very involved in what's going on in our district and are eager to learn and work to improve. Not to say that there's room for improvement, there's always room for improvement. Right now we're working on a lot of quality issues with these folks, getting them used to our schedules, our routines, because we haven't been through a year, so these people do not really know what the school year entails other than the supervisor that we retain. Um, and they're gonna continue to learn 
at a rapid pace going into next year. Um, I'm really happy with the turnaround, at least going from that bigger vendor that we've had the last, at least since I've been here, to what we have right now because they're very responsive. Um, our B&G staff is kind of the eyes and ears to what's going on around the district. Um, we basically, if we have any complaints, we get it through school dude or through our administrators. Uh, and what that does is allows us to have an idea pretty quickly if there's uh, some deterioration in the service or the quality of service for us to get on it. Um, we take a lot of uh, information from the staff. We've been interviewing a lot of the staff, the teachers, in the various buildings to see how the performance has been going. And right now we're pretty happy with what we're hearing. We have had some up and downs, but I think that was related to coming in on, in September, starting you know during the school year and getting these people on board. Um, to date, since, since September, uh, we've lost four custodians. Uh, one we replaced because of work quality issues. One decided to terminate on their own. Uh, one left for a higher paying job. Uh, and we have one out on a medical uh, reason right now. Um, the thing that's been impressive to me is the replacement time. The average replacement time to bring in new employees is anywhere has been anywhere from two to five days. Uh, with our last vendor, Clean Mark, we were up to weeks before we get a replacement employee, and sometimes a month or more. So we're we're really happy about that. So we know if we're gonna if somebody's gonna leave or if somebody's dismissed, the turnaround has been really quick. And that's kind of what we're shooting for all along. So we're happy with that. So we're still working with these folks on uh, route routines, because if they get in the routine, they get to be a little more efficient, get to know their people. Uh, we're working on consistent work quality, because in this line of occupation, the work quality seems to go up and down through the course of the year. So it's, it's always an issue to motivate the folks and it's, and it's really difficult to motivate them. Um, but we also, in motivating them, we want them to be happy because we don't want the turnover. We want them to be happy while they're working here. Um, we want them to be aware of the staff and what their needs are, so we stress the importance of you know, getting to know the staff, the teachers, so they know what the needs are, because every teacher's a little bit different. One's a little pickier than the next, so we're trying to make everybody happy. Um, and that's what and that's what we're working for. Uh, we're still fine-tuning uh, responsibilities with after-hours activities because we added the employee. You know, we added an extra staff person to the custodial to try to help out, basically at the high school with after-school uh, events, uh, and also to fill in for people who were on sick leave or on vacation or whatever. Um, I think it went fairly well. We still have a lot to learn. We're trying to get somebody on that program that's consistently doing the same thing with events and working with the same people. So we're working closely with the athletic department and scheduling to make this as smooth as we can make it. Um, George, how about community ed? How's that? I know there's been some issues with the rooms open and things like that. And Renee said now there's a schedule or something? Yeah, there's, al there's always been a schedule. It's just a matter, we have to work off the schedule and that schedule is constantly evolving. Sometimes it changes, sometimes the rooms uh, get booked. There might be a double booking from time to time where you know our staff gets involved with a little bit of that, trying to get people in the right place. And we're working with Trent and his, and his staff to you know make that uh, as smooth as possible. There have been some issues, but again, that's part of the routine far as unlocking doors, what doors get unlocked, when do we lock them back up, when, you know, when people come and go. Uh, we've been trying to get our folks, our custodians to, we print the schedule out and the schedule is available to them when they walk in the door. It's just a matter of being as simple as looking at the schedule when they walk in the building to go to work before they punch in. 
we still don't have that there. They aren't there yet. And we've been pushing that from day one. But that's what you deal with when we're dealing with those folks. And all we can do is keep harping on that. So if there's a schedule change or if there's some other issues we hear about it, we try to correct it after the fact or work to correct it so it doesn't happen again. So, and if we have a lot of that, I certainly like to hear about it because we look at every issue because there's a multitude of reasons why these things happen. So, uh, we're happy to hear that. Um, leadership has been more involved. Uh, our athletic department, our scheduling has been more involved. I've been more involved. Our, our um, building technicians have been more involved than they ever have. And we have our uh, supervisor from Blue Ribbon that basically keeps that going, keeps everything going, put together. So that's really all I can say about Blue Ribbon. I'm, ha I'm happy with them, and if there's any underlying things going on, I certainly want to hear about them. I totally get having a schedule change and I'm not looking at it because I can have it on the calendar and forget to look at it. Um, only four turnovers, losses of employees over the whole school Since year. September. That's, Since September. That's significantly less than the previous year, isn't it? Very significant. Yeah. We're probably up to four or five a month. Yeah. And the pay is how much higher now? Two dollars an hour? Yeah, about that. Um, yeah, it's close to the uh, fifty or so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Only four all year. I think that's great. Yeah. Any other questions for him? If not, then let's scoot on to the five cast presentation, Dave. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, George. So five cast is one of the software models um, offered and, and provided by a company called Forecast 5. And so they have numerous products. We, um, we license two of them. We pay for two of their software programs each year. Uh, Fivecast for uh, forecasting, uh, budget modeling, um, and Fivesight for comparison of data. Uh, both of these programs um, produce good graphics um, and help you look at data in interesting ways and make interesting comparisons easily, both within your own district and compared to other districts. Uh, five Cast, uh, we use that to make our five year forecast or budget expenditure and revenue for all funds. Um, and really, it it's kind of a compilation of all the little pieces that I typically do in a given year. It's all on one site. It's one enormous database where you can enter um, all sorts of assumptions and variables, what you expect to happen, what you conservatively expect to happen, or uh, optimistically expect to happen. You can run different, entirely different models based on what kind of assumptions you want uh, to input, and it holds them all in it, both within, say, Fund 10 and all the different levels of expenditure itself, or um, all the things that feed into that, especially on the <laughs> revenue side. Um, so it has projection models for uh, and tables for all the revenue limit components, all the state aid components, enrollments, uh, debt service, all these things. So it, it is a one-stop shop for everything that I do in detail in a given year um, for that year and for the next year. Um, this will hold all of that and project it over five years. And so, in our case, it's when we have our biennial state budgets, that has a big effect, a very big effect on what our outlook is. So, 
you know, things may change going forward, um, but since Act 10, it's been difficult to say what might happen beyond a known state budget. Budgets have been coming in late. Um, there's always a lot of speculation that there might be no increase per people increase in per people aid, no increase in the revenue limit per member. And without that kind of information for us, because we levy to the full extent permissible um, through the revenue limit calculation, we have a hard time projecting what might occur beyond that known two-year biennial budget or if you're first year into it, then, then one year. And so right now, we have the governor's proposed budget. We know what that is, um, and it looks great. It looks really, really good for school districts. But at the same time, I, I don't think that many districts are uh, working under the assumption that, that much of it will happen. So all that being said, it's a it's kind of the best model we have for long-term modeling because it holds all the assumptions. You can see what your assumptions are. You can see um, we're, we're going to plan to buy a school vehicle every year for the next two years and then stop. You can enter that in. Down to the single, whatever detail you want, you can change and, and enter what it will be for five years. Uh, you can do that as a flat dollar amount or percentage. So the health insurance would say it's 10% increase every year. You can change it. You can say 10%, 5%, 8%. All these things, it holds it all. You can see what you're assumptions are, but at the end of the day, the result is only as good as, as what you've entered. So it, it's a tool that is useful for uh, modeling and forecasting out to five years, um, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, from, from my perspective, uh, it, it, it doesn't help you predict the future. It's, it's a tool that we use and, and I always try to budget conservatively. Um, and I'm glad you do. <laughs> and at the same time, you know, anytime you get beyond a couple years, you, you really have to say it's, you know, it, it's based on significant assumptions. Right. So I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about five site first, but I have, I have a couple of examples of outputs from each of those programs. Um, actually, I'll give you the, the podcast one first. So I mentioned um, the governor's budget that was proposed. Uh, this is a comparison between the five-year forecast that would be modeled in the fall, where we're saying it's a million-dollar deficit next year, which was the basis for our referendum. Um, and the only thing that we changed in the comparison scenario is we entered in all of the changes from the, the governor's budget. So you can see um, the changes, the, the green is the original budget and the blue is the governor's budget. And so these are just some simple visuals and outputs that, like I said, it's, it's pretty slick in creating visuals and creating charts and ways to look at information and data uh, pretty easily. And so it obviously has a purpose. And I know that that dark blue can be hard to read on that on the paper. Is this replaced <coughs> anything, any, anything that you're using now? No, it's kind of, um, like I said, it, it puts everything in one spot. Where right now I have a whole bunch of spreadsheets and you know other different things that I use to then build onto other things. Um, then ultimately getting the actual numbers into Skyward mm -hmm. and then back out of Skyward to report to the EPI. So it, it's a one-stop shop for doing this kind of comparison. For saying what if, you know, here's a group of assumptions or scenarios that we're interested in, yeah. in talking about. <coughs> Pretty quickly we can, we can compare. Uh, and that is another component um, where the company itself, um, Forecast 5, if I want help with something, you know, I, for the governor's model, I said, could you enter 
uh, the governor's model for me so that I can compare to, to what we have. And so they can do it very quickly. Um, if I need help with any component of it as I'm going, uh, they're very helpful. So it, it's a, they're a helpful company. It, it's pretty easy to use when I'm working with them to create whatever we're interested in looking at. Um, at the same time, it's, we don't talk about five-year forecasts very often because, you know, the data is not, it, it's not great. There's a lot of assumptions built in. Yeah, I looked through their, their other website. It looks, looks it's, it's slick. It's slick. It looks like clean potential for some building. You know, they have, uh, was it five lab or something? Oh, yeah. Potential. Yeah, they have all sorts of, uh, yeah, I mean, and mapping and all sorts of stuff. Right. Um, so five site is dealing with data that comes from, the, they have the, these software programs that scrape data from DPI and, and other sources that's reported from school districts. Um, and it puts it all in a warehouse and a database and it creates really you know, beautiful and interesting charts and comparisons among whatever districts in the state you choose. Uh, and so I have a MBC plus a couple group, and we have a um, FTE group where we have similar uh, student FTE plus with the, the 10 above us and below us. Um, and it's, it's useful to look at to, to a certain degree in that the data is always last year's data because it's reported they scrape it from what's been reported to DPI, and then DPI publishes that, so it's a little bit older. And it's also, um, for some positions, it's not necessarily as useful as for others. And that's because it's based on how a district reports the data to DPI, where it's not always uh, the same. Um, you might, it, it's possible on some of these reports to report things such as media specialist or librarian. So you think you're comparing something and you might not be. Um, some of the assistant principals and deans aren't coded the same when they're reported to DPI. Some positions have no codes to DPI. Uh, so we found, uh, for instance, when we were looking, uh, the principals wanted data to talk about assistant principals, saying, I want to see a comparison. Let's compare districts. Um, we got that data from, from FiveSite. We looked at it, and, we, and, and it looks great. Uh, great graphics, good comparisons, very clear. Uh, but then we had to go and, and actually ask the districts, you know, how many APs do you have in each building? How many, do you have deans? You know, what do you, what do you have? Because the data isn't necessarily always 100% right or what you want it to be. So. Five site, I think we're, we've had discussions about possibly not continuing that uh, software package. It is good um, for discussion and you can, some things are very straightforward. Um, you know, a guidance counselor is a guidance counselor and that's well reported, a principal is a principal. Some things are well reported, are to DPI and so that you can pull that data and, and be confident in it. Um, and it's good in a general sense to be able to look at us compared to other MBC schools or other schools of similar size and you can get a good sense of things. So it has student FTE, it has teacher FTE, um, it has salary, some finance type stuff which I can also get out of uh, podcasts. Um, and it has some grade um, reporting related stuff and when I talked to Trish about that package of, of information um, related to test scores and the like she can get the same data out of uh, wise dash or what have you with from DPI directly um, and, and that is her preferred place to get that so all of that being said it, it's got great great charts and great visuals um, but the more important, the more value you place on something, um, the more important it is to double check and say, 
you know, in your Richmond, is, is this the right number of APs that you have in your district? So this is something, um, an example of how we've used this. Mark said they want a comparison within MBC of um, all teaching positions. And I said, okay. I emailed them at Forecast 5, uh, 5 site, and I said, hey, what, what can you create for me to kind of pull all this together? Uh, and they sent this back. Um, you take a look at this. Where there's um, just all different types of interesting graphics. Um, you can, I can go online and look at it and hover my mouse over it and see every single dot, see all the districts. It, it's, it's, it's a powerful tool to visualize and compare data, but there are some issues sometimes with the data, and it is a year old. So the issue being that you really want to know what you're actually looking at. It's not always defined in the same way from one school district yeah, to another. It, it, that's, that's one issue. Yeah. You get a pretty Did general picture, but if you, you're going to base some significant decisions, you really got to drill down and call and make sure. Which you probably want to do anyway because it is one year old. How is it different? It is different from the DPIs. So mm -hmm. what, you can't graph like this with the DPI data? This has some unique abilities. comparison abilities. Okay. Yeah. Because I know I could get reports before from. Right, so if you just want, what is the district reported for uh, teachers or for admin, you can go to DPI and download that for you know, any historical year. Well, they even offered to do comparison reports with whatever school districts you wanted. So if you wanted to use the full-time equivalent, or if you wanted to use the Middle Board of Commerce, or if you wanted to pick certain schools yep. that were doing the same, yep. they would do that. Yes, and so a lot of times you'll get data. But then, and, and there are some things that DPI does. We can get some certain graphics uh, of certain things. But th this is much more bad. robust as far as what you're comparing. So what is the membership cost on this, or the subscription? Each program uh, is $3,500 per year. Okay. Each program. And there's a support fee. I believe it's $1,500 for each. So about $5,000 each, so $10,000. $10,000. And would you say that you're getting a $10,000 benefit from these software? I don't know that we use five sites. I, w I don't know that it's worth $5,000 use to us. That's not to say that it couldn't be if we saw, if we had a use or a project or initiative. But at the same time, you know, the, a lot of the same data is available directly from DPI. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we also recently hired McGrath to do an in depth comparison. So, what this really does is just give you snapshots and interesting ways to compare or to search, you know, whether it be a printout like I provided here or if it's, I'm doing it directly online. You know, like I said, the online version has a lot of capability where you can hover over things and you can sort things and do all these different things to the data once you get it in these charts. Um, but all that being said, um, you know, if we're looking at we want to say how do, how do certain positions compare within our district to other districts? Um, this is one way to visualize that. But you know, we can also go to DPI. We can also have a principal call another principal. Uh, you know, so there's there's other ways to get the data. So when you look at this, did you? see this, or is maybe this is your first time looking at it? Is it filling the need that you had asked or hoped to see? Are you able to see from it what you were? Well, definitely. You know, I mean, you, you can, you know, just in the first couple of pages, there's just on the salary comparisons and that, you know, every little red dot is a school reporting, blue dots are where we are in relationship. You know, every, you know it's, very helpful depending on how accurate the data is. That's going to help us as a yeah. board. As well. mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a good snapshot, but, and if we're going to make a decision on it, you, you might say, okay, principals confirm that number. 
then you said this is this year old thing that is within right. DPI. Right. It's always a year. So as a board, Penalties. we can look at DPI too. Okay. So if you're able to gather some tools for five year forecasts. So, okay. So, yeah, I talked about five say that. Five casts, it, it is a very useful tool. It's one stop and it holds. It holds the model, so like all the assumptions I made um, and all the inputs we did um, for the five-year model in this last fall, it's still there, it's still in the model. I can see what we did and what we were thinking at that time. And it projects out five years. You know, and now I can compare it to some new, some new uh, assumptions and variables. So that, that does, it is more powerful. You can get more granular um, in projecting five years than I have historically done. You know, I've done uh, three years previously. I've talked about things to think about over five years, but I, this is very detailed. You know, obviously balancing the detail level with the degree of variance that we're talking about over that period of time. Maybe it's not as useful, but if we want to look at things over that period of time, this is a, a great tool to do. So I, you know, I think I've talked for a while. If if you want to see what either of these look like, I can show you, have them up, um, or not. When we were at the um, conference in January, I went to a session by Forecast Five, and they. At, they were full, they had a lot of people there, and they were doing comparisons of, uh, that had more to do with probably what Trish might use it for, that a school board member could look at, you know, if you're going to put money into a program, um, and then how much you got out of it to help you make financial decisions. Um, I wish I could be more specific, I wish I had brought the handouts that I'd gotten at that session, but I think there's a lot more capability to the side that Dave probably doesn't work with. Oh, it's right in, it's in five said I can access it. Um, that the software has a lot of capability and it can compare and make visuals that are compelling. You know, what does it cost to have them come and present to a school or a few schools if we were to bring a few schools together that use it so that we could see? Because I think the value of a tool is knowing how to use it. So if it would give us a better tracking we're way not, of tracking. We're not going to use it. Well, it's for board us to be able to do. I mean, it was presented at the yeah. school board convention for board, board members yeah. to use. I talked to uh, Jeff Crew, who is the Managing uh, partner of Forecast Five, uh, and, and he he said that it's not a tool for board members, but that it's something if if there's certain types of comparisons with visuals you want to see on a certain time period, um, that it can produce them really easily. Uh, so if there's something you wanted to see on a recurring basis, I would set it up or work with Trish or work with them directly to set it up and then going forward it's just a matter of downloading that now most of this data we're talking about annually you know when they scrape that data and then upload their their new version um, but that that was his perspective on you know the use of these tools um, within the district and, and where 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 does that use reside you know I, I can go in there and especially within five site they have so many things to look at and I will, can go in and look and compare it to the middle border uh, or other comparative sized schools and spend a lot of time looking at stuff because it's interesting you know and it's compelling visually but at the same time you know especially on the finance side I produce a lot of this in other ways and it's you know published on our website that's presented to the board 
And it's a matter of what do we want to focus on and, and what do we feel is the, the highest leverage data to be discussing. You know, it's easy to, it is really easy to get off track and say, well, that's <laughs> fascinating. Right. You know, but it's what purpose does it serve? Yeah. You know, it might not really help us make any decision that we're even kind with. Um, at the presentation, we were talking about, uh, I don't remember exactly what information it was, but they were compiling data from school districts on a monthly basis so that they had more current data all the time instead of just getting it from DPI on a yearly basis. So it was more current and more accurate. One of the newer things they, they are doing is budget to actual type stuff, on the, at least on the financial side. Mm -hmm. um, they surveyed a bunch of districts a few years ago and said, is this something that would be useful? And I said, well, I already do it. You know? So they started adding that capability, and, and you can get very similar um, products to what I provide now. The one thing they would add is comparison with other districts. Um, and if that's useful, then that's something we should look at. You know, I, I think a lot of times it's, it's most useful to say, all right, you know, where are we at compared to where we plan to be at? But, but you're right, they, they do add some capability. I don't know if there's um, current updates on the testing and re that reporting side or not, um, but I could ask about that. I have a hard time seeing the value of comparing ourselves to the school every month. I think when you establish your path, Year, you really would be distracting yourself and going on your what your goals are for the school. You keep looking at everybody else's rather than comparing us to ourselves. Where, where are we getting to? And then once or twice a year, maybe look at somebody else's. I can't see doing it every month. Do you have any ideas? They don't gather the data. Yeah, the data out of months. Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. see there no, being some. have some of these comparisons, you know, on the on the website, right? But it's like, what do I have, you know, two charts and some definitions for comparative cost, and I have more for revenue limit factors and aid factors. You know, that's high level view, and it's a comparison of neighboring districts, but, you know, if you want something more in depth, this is a great tool for generating that kind of stuff. Do you think you can do that for the Yes, but I don't know that how helpful it will be with all the presentations we're looking at. Yeah, I know that in the past. Just to see what the information is, what would it actually provide us data on? Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for me? Um, their websites informative as well. Four fifty-nine. Can you tell me again, Forecast 5, and what, what are the two pieces of software called that you, we actually have a subscription to? Five cast for budgeting and forecasting, and five site for comparison. And that's S-I-G-H-T, and each of those fives are the number five. Thanks all of you for your presentation. We're gonna hit the policies now, unless there's more questions for Dave. If not, um, are there any particular policies here where we might want somebody's feedback from any of these? No. <laughs> Let's hit that first then. Well, should we just go down the list? Well, I was just meaning that they could scoot if they oh. wanted to, but since they're here. <laughs> yeah, right. Appreciate it. On the tour, I had questions about I emailed the people, and okay. uh, none of them are here. So okay. nobody has to stay as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> okay. like to go. Well, there's one okay. the question yes. you had. Okay. Yes. And I, I've got that down too. So. Well, the, why don't we just start well, at the top of the road? Yep. Yeah, so right down thank down. you guys. I'm not going to make Oh, but we do need you guys still for the close session. Yeah, okay. they're going to stick around. Great. Okay. We'll try or and be efficient here. If you want to stick in here. 
All right, so let's hit the job description. Oh, shoot. So, uh, so these two, uh, these, both these two policies are Thank layovers that we had to wait Thank for you. Stu to get here with us. And Stu did come in and spend time with us. And so uh, what you have in here is reflective of our conversation with Stu, correct? Okay, so the changes that have been made on here. Uh, and you know, again, there was a, a few pieces that were confusing on here. Uh, but again, the clean copy that you got is what Stu worked with and recommends. Uh, uh, we put in the policy. So part of the, con I think a little bit of the confusion was on this first one, is the way the original intent of the policies were set up as far as uh, whether board or district administrator had authority to make these changes and some of the other uh, job descriptions. And that's why we were a little confused about why is you know, support staff mentioned in these policies right. and what have you. So again, we've got a pretty good understanding of what this is now and good. so. So on that first paragraph there, maintained, is that asking the location where it's maintained or just that it is maintained? Well, it's maintained in the district office. But is that something we need to be spelling out in that first thing or just the fact that we are going to keep them maintained? <laughs> well, we're going to maintain them, but I think there was a place in here where, but it just seems like an incomplete sentence. I, I wasn't sure. Maintained. Approved by the board because and it maintained. Seem. It could be that we're just going to keep them up to date. Because Maybe that's what it means. And it maintained that point, but I should be approved. From what I had written was where. I thought they were asking for where they were maintained. Can't be where they are. So we're and if we want to put in the district office, right, we can sure add that in there. Yeah. Uh, but that didn't. Uh, it is um, like um, from Neola. It is kind of listed as a fill in the blank. Like right. there should be something filled okay. in. There. Kind of what I thought. Put it in the district yeah. office. So is that what they're looking for? Is yeah. the place district office? So that's what we'll stick yep. in there. If that's okay with everybody. Employee lounge. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, so that one, I think we're good on that. And how are you coming on those guidelines? Well, so uh, well, that's our next trip. Stu's coming up, and we're going to hit the guidelines now. Good. And the guidelines, the guidelines are, you look at that, but they're not, they don't need to be board approved. They're administrative guidelines. It's just how do we, we want to implement your palace right. po policy. Oh. But, I mean, it's, you guys should see them. You had another question? On yeah. This so you said Stu explained why the support staff were in there. Why mm -hmm. are the support staff in there? It's that's the ones that we have authority to change if there's if there's an adjustment. But what Lori's asking is this is under the one thousands administration. Yeah. Right. So but why is support staff in? I would ask the same question. Yeah, no, and that's what we asked him too, but it's the way you evidently several years ago set this up is that you're saying that uh, you know, this policy directs the district administrator to revise job descriptions for the support staff. Okay. We can go with it. I mean, it's a little larger than what you'd think would be under administration, but more encompassing, I should say. So everyone's okay with that one, so we can put it forward on the next meeting? Very good. On to the next one. And the family leave, there was a couple pieces on here. Probably the biggest one is, you know, there's four options for how you count uh, or when you start your mm -hmm. you know, fiscal, you got calendar year. Uh, I was surprised because uh, uh, talking with other people, uh, they had gone from calendar to fiscal, I think. But then as Stu said, the vast majority of their schools go with time of use. Can you explain that to me? Well, so if you were going to go on FMLA today, yeah, that's your year. Today is the year to start. It starts. Oh, yeah. okay. It's for the most fiscal years. It just makes sense. I think too. so. You know, I think it's there's difficult. You know, it adds more complexity to the personnel keeping track of it side. And Jody mentioned it that night at that meeting when we talked about it previously. But as far as the cost to the district, it would be the most responsible. And I don't think it should make it that much more difficult to track because you need the date that they start anyway. Yeah, so you know, it's just got uh, it. you know, a different way of talking with you know, Dave and them. It's you know when you when you walk outside of consistency, 
know, yeah. it just or it adds another level. But personally, I'd rather see it go from the point of point of uses. I think so too. Everybody you know, the else. The more flexible we can be with people. You know, that too. And any other questions on that one? We're good with that one. Yeah, so right. where would you like that reflected in uh, the language? It of goes the on page uh, it's one, two, second page, right in the bottom here, where it says amount of leave available, and it says in a calendar year. Okay. So we do something like Testify point of use. Of point of approval or whatever. Day of use. Date of approval. Got it. Date of approval. Yeah. Are you comfortable with that? What would you like it to say? Um, <laughs> rather than calendar year in yep. that last paragraph, point in a point of use. Or date of use. Date first of date use. Of first use. date of use. Yeah. Let's do that. That sounds more clear. In from from. From, from first date of use. Uh, that the, sounds clear. Yeah. The other two pieces that were uh, that we had questions on were back on one of the last pages there we had a paragraph where it re really relates to if an administrator is teaching classes, you know, a part of a teacher, right above coordinating leaves, mm -hmm. the one up there, and we said, no, leave that in. And then uh, right below that in coordinating leaves, uh, we were going to put May to be consistent with. Instead of us. Yeah. Okay. So that's it with that one. Great. Long time coming for that one because we couldn't get a hold of Stu. But, uh, and he, his next visit, we are going to start uh, working on the the proceed the guidelines piece because we've paid for that, and so they we have access to all their guidelines. Now we just have to tweak them to match what we want here. Great. And the educational goals and expectations, screenwriting seems good mm -hmm. to me. One second. So policy twenty one thirty one. Yes. What yes. I thought. Okay, well, let me catch up with you guys. So I, as long as those changes are continued through, looks good. So this one is okay. Everyone's okay with that? And uh, <coughs> I know that was okay. Oh, it's just that chap that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, chapter 161 that they do a little work on. So you guys got that. Okay, that's okay. Okay, which one's up next? On to 2270. Religion in the curriculum. Yes. Yeah. Seems pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, and that one's clean. Everyone's good at that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please can move forward to the next one is 2271, early college credit program. Nice, short, sweet, green change seems legit, understandable. Clear, eighth, ninth, 10th, and 11th grade mm -hmm. rather than high school. Yeah, and the big thing is there's no way you know, holding it to 18 credits. Well, and the other thing, though, is can we use this? We're the only school in Wisconsin that has the University of Minnesota College in the Schools, mm -hmm. and we have no policy regarding, because we pay for that just like we do the Wisconsin. early college credit program. Yeah. So my question was, can, we add, can we add the University of Minnesota College in the schools program to this policy, or do we have to create an entirely separate policy? We don't. We can edit it to our own specific ones as long as we. I'm going to check on that. That was yeah. the question yeah. there, and uh, so we'll, I'll we'll, get an answer to that one. And can we move it forward as long as we're in agreement with it? Because it's that would be the difference. Adding it, it would be an addition or creation, so we can move it forward and then add, add, uh, add yeah. to it. Because it'd be in that very first paragraph. Yeah. So if we're good with that, I would move this one forward too. And if we don't get that answer back, then we'll take it off that night. Yeah, and just in my brief talking with Trish, there's a, a piece in the handbook about the University of Minnesota. So I just need to, I just need to find out if we should really put a policy in here or if we need a separate policy. Okay. Because this is Wisconsin. So we'll get this one moving forward, and if we can add that one into mm -hmm. it. Yeah. We'll add it. All right. On to the next one. 2271.01, start college where, now. Where else program. would you put that? Pardon? You where else would you put it? Yes, so why would you want that. to? I know it's you really want to. Well, that's uh, I just I need not. to find out. Yeah. Just need some <laughs> clarity, <laughs> clarity on it, because right now, again, I, I haven't seen it in the handbook on what it says. Right. But we are unique with using the University of Minnesota. Right. So my word I'm going to question is, so if it's University of Wisconsin, and now it's University of Minnesota, 
They're Why all not just we'll open it up to yeah. any you know, accredited college in the United States or global? I don't yeah, know. you're right because they get Why would you want to just limit it to two? So you might want to ask that question too. Okay. Well, you know, again, the, the changes in this policy that's, that's were initially problem. put in because of the change of the if you're look um, the, pro the, the yeah. name change of the program. Yeah. They change it from. Well, there's so many online though now. You know, so the yeah. college and the schools is, is different than just taking a class online. If you're taking it in your high school, yeah. it's the teacher True. is going to the University of Minnesota to yeah. get the yeah. credit, have credit to pay for right. our students for to get that credit. Yeah. That. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to check on the questions right. for that? Right, and a lot of it has to do with because they eliminated the course option, yeah. youth options, and now it says ECCT thing. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. so I'll get clarity on that one. So um, this is the first time with the 2271.01? Mm -hmm. We'll yes. keep it as it is for now mm -hmm. until we have yep. questions that arise from it. Yep. All right. Okay. So the next one is 2271 Early College Credit Program. We did that one already? I must have opened that twice. I'm sorry. Yep. I did. So this Start College one is new because it's specific to technical school? Is that correct? Well, um, they changed the name of it because they eliminated the course options and youth options, and now it's this, uh, it's the early college credit program, and that's the change in the policy. Okay. But the question Lori had was, you know, again, this, this deals with Wisconsin schools. Oh, and, we, and we have a deal with the University of Minnesota, and we just don't have a yep. policy anywhere. Yeah, I'm talking about the next one, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Which one's that? we were moving on. We are, 2271.01? Yeah. Yeah, and it's a first time with that policy because, like he said, a change in the law or the way it's called. Classified, would you call it that name? <laughs> yeah, and, and this one really is, you know, part of it's the Wisconsin piece, but it's also the 27, 227101 deals with the number of credits that we allow them to take that we'll pay for. So that's 2271.01 right, so specifically? Mark, we mark B. Yeah, yeah. We mark B down at the bottom. So really it's saying that we'll only, you take any more than 18, we're not paying for it. Okay. Okay, that's what this policy is. Okay. The other one is one that Lori had a question on. Great. Perfect. So you're okay with this one? 2271.01? Yeah, that's what I Great. All right. Now, homebound instructions, 2412. Wait, are we going to have a homebound? I was wondering that. Uh, we, yeah, uh, we don't have two. I don't think we have many. I don't think we have many. Well, I think we got. We we're trying. Yeah, to, we had one on homebound just recently, but uh, an IEP kid or someone else? Yeah, an IEP kid. Yeah. So do we need to select out of D through I? Hold on a second. Let me get my. I think all those need to be. Wanted all of them. They're all checked. All of them. If they're here, this right here. I didn't know yeah. how you could really pick one. Yes. No, they're all checked. We want all of them. Okay. <laughs> they they are all checked. All right. Okay, hold on. Let me make sure them. So E through I are all checked. Yes. Correct. Yeah. I must have yelled that out of my office and you were at your desk at that time. I agree. <laughs> yeah. All right, so good. We're good with that one too, 2412. I do. Well, so we're on to 2461, <laughs> recording the IEP team. Uh-uh. What do you have a question? Oh, you were at a side conversation. Um, Wait a minute, which one are we on? 2412. Okay. We were there. You're you were just up. too slow. We're checking You're them all. I was helping change <laughs> uh, check the letters. Yeah, E through right. I. That's so, this one. But, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Talkative. Just try. It <laughs> got stricken that the district has the right to refute, withhold homebound instruction for A, B, and C. And if you look at A, B, and C, I think these are pretty important issues that we could be held liable for. And I asked Abby about it, and she agreed and communicated with Tasia, and they're checking. Because mm -hmm. I don't think we want a teacher to go into a home to teach a child with, and be the only adult there with the child. Yeah, you're right. Oh, I've, I've done I wouldn't many, many, do it. I've done it many, many times. Really? Well, I wouldn't. Well, I guess there is a feeling right now. How did you? Uh, how else do you do homebound? That. Well, I did they it couldn't in unless the they had it. Um, uh, the, but not if it's a kid who's medically fragile. 
they can't go up but public. I had a kid on. who was on chemo and I had to go into his home. Okay, I'm missing well, something right here now. There, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. well, this is the same that was all the parent care. care. We are reserving the right to withhold homebound instruction if the, well, first of all, if the instructor's presence in the place of a student's confinement presents a hazard to the health of the teacher. Second, a parent or other adult in authority is not home. When the yeah, those should there. not be stricken. No, okay. absolutely not. Okay, so Good you're God. saying keep A, B, and C. Oh, absolutely. Yes. All right. Absolutely. So, so does that make not. sense to you? I mean, yeah, and my response to, to Lori and Abby, and I, I mean, I'm fine with whatever, but because those came from Miola, so I just forwarded the question just to you. Can you provide some clarification? I mean, obviously, we can bring them back in, but yep. I just thought because it was brought in in the update that way, that it would be helpful to hear the clarification on yep. why. I bet they would have to. Well, I think they had to. I think yeah, they I'm glad you caught that. Possibly. Um, um, yeah, there's absolutely no way those would look at your back. Yeah. Okay, so know. the general consensus here is that those would not be stricken. So if you yes, want to, sure. that you would see. Um, and the other thing doesn't have to be changed in the policy, but I wanted to know, because of the way it was written, um, homebound instruction doesn't have to be at the request of the parent. Can it be a district decision? And Abby said yes. Yes. It oh, definitely. It's, it's up to so us how we deliver services. So does this policy make it sound like it cannot be? I it, thought it was fine. determined by us. It's fine. I just wanted a clarification on it, and she gave it to me, and I thought someone else might be interested. All right. Because I thought that's I read that's it. Really important you. That agency yeah. Wow. Just it will be considered by the district administrator. Or is that identified in the 504? No, a 504 plan is worth less. It's less than that. <laughs> yeah. It's just a piece it's of still, paper. It, it, it still has some teeth, but not it's like, an IEP. Document like an IEP. Right. Uh, 504 is. Yeah. But it doesn't, it's soft. So it's okay. IEP light. I don't know if there is. A, identified. Okay, so what are our questions on this? Just the uh, strong we striking don't want ABC? Correct. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. Right. But I've already sent that off to Stu okay. for clarification. Okay. So that. Well, and I talked to Abby. She didn't mention anything about that, so I'm just a little. I was a little lost. You've already that text piece. all up. Not yeah. text, but marked yep. them as yep. part of it. So okay. we, we marked E through I and then unmarked that back to the student. One slash. And that whole record. paragraph in front of it. Mm -hmm. okay. Keep the whole thing. I'd like to know why they struck. Well, I That'll be interesting. Think it must be a mistake. Oh, wow. All right. So then, twenty four sixty one recording of IEP team meeting. That was fun. Mm -hmm. Pretty self explanatory. You needed what? the update. Yeah. Oh yeah. Good. All right. So it's okay. good with as it is. Thanks guys for getting those done. Yeah, and we had talked to you know, on. once we get past this referendum, we'll try and you know we'll get admin on these and then a couple of board members beforehand that way we'll be able to put out some change points like I did this time on it the helps. agenda. Yes, definitely helps. All right, so we're on to personnel update. Yeah. Our motion for items guys. for topics for action. Um, so I make a motion to Hey guy crew. Um, a B and C. I'll second that. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Catherine. But Any questions on those yes, guys? Yes, they do. If I could. What's that? Um, so when we move to approve the high school course offerings, mm -hmm. but my concern is if there's any modification work that needs to be done with that, are they allowed to make modifications after we approve? And that's my concern. Okay, good question too. Mm -hmm. um, Bob made the motion, Catherine seconded it to approve items nine, A, B, and C with one question or a need for clarification. If m there are changes that are needed for the high school course offerings, would it need to come back to us for another approval? If there's changes? Yeah, further changes. And, and uh, let me elaborate. I don't want that to be the case yeah. because I don't think it's timely. I don't think it's efficient. But That's why I'm asking it. is if we should in the future be approving the high school course offerings all together and just have that for, as she gave, 
presentation to say here are course offerings. I don't know what input I'm going to have as a board member on the course offerings to say, yeah, this looks good, or no, you're going to add something else in this. The only concern I have is flexibility from this point forward to make modifications um, to make sure that. You know, I would say if there's a new course, you need to know. I would think so too for but information. As far as I the don't rest, need to approve it. I would say, you know, they're gonna, we're always going to be massaging things. As long as it stays within, you know, a high percentage of where we're in yes. the intent was. But all new things should. We should have to approve. Oh, I think so. Or just be aware of it. Any new courses. And we have two policies that say it in a state statute okay. that say we need to approve right. the course yeah. offering. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And I think just because they're being offered doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have a number of students sign up for them so that they'll actually take place. Is that correct? Yep, and I would say there's probably some courses in the course offering book this year that are in there that will not run for a variety of reasons. I, I leave them in there just so as you're looking through the 60 pages that, that you're aware of what's in there. But so, and I, if I can just speak to as well as, um, you know, when I've spoken to other principals in terms of what they do for this process, um, typically it's approval for new courses that it, you're running under the assumption that what's been in place has remained in place if there's significant um, things that are being deleted, like the concepts courses, for example, that those are the types of things that would, you know, Come to us. A, awareness, and B, for approval, that it isn't necessarily, and again, I'm just, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but in terms of what um, other districts around us do, it's typically not the all 60 pages put in front of the board, it's just, you know, yeah, but that's the way it's kind of been done, so that's what I did, which is fine, you know, but, so. All right, so we have a motion and a second on the table to approve the topics for question. action. Yep, sure. About the personal update, um, I noticed again that there was a position posted on our website, but I don't see any exit or retirement. Uh, some kind of special ed. Apparel? I think no. It was an instructional staff or teacher, and I think it was at the elementary. Yeah, cross cap. Oh, that's. Um is that the John? Okay, we, we have a, another situation with an unlicensed person that until he gets licensed, it's, it's kind of the same as the math situation for high school. That we just. It's they're not, non renewed if they don't have the right license. Right, right. And but they're, I mean, I don't see any non renewal. But I don't think the deadline has come for non renewals yet. He no, had, he'll. He, he had, won't. He's not licensed, and he won't be back unless he gets licensed. He was, he was told he was eligible. He was, he came out of. Teach America. No, yes, and he was down. He got licensed in New Orleans, where he was teaching. Came up here, said that they would license him. He submitted all his documentation. They said, no, you got to do this, this, and this. So he's been all year long trying to get this straightened away, and we just find a good position that, you know what, we're opening it up. If we can find someone, you're done. So he hasn't been exited yet, so it wouldn't be. No, 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 he's still working. He's still working. But if we can find someone else, then. And that's the position we have to take right now. You know, it's driving Dave a little nuts, too, because of, uh, you know, if we don't have, we only, if we, if we can't get these people on a variance or a uh, provisional license, what have you, you know, we can't legally pay them. And so we're running about out of options, although. State DPI I know this is the difficulty they have finding people in that, so they're trying to be a little lenient on these these waivers and that. But it's now it's a point of you know, like they're you lenient up front. Them. They're not lenient the next year through. Sure. Yeah. 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 And we've got a couple people or one person for sure. I, the last two years I've had signed that we can't find anyone, and I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, you can get in big trouble from DPI. So, so does anyway. that answer your question, Lori? Yes. Yeah. It's okay. it's an elementary. Uh, so we have a motion on the table and a second to approve all those topics for action. And if we could in the minutes include what those are. I'm not saying them right yes. now. But yep. Yep. <laughs> all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. So one through on the table. Uh, Bob? Nothing. Catherine? Nothing. Lori? Not at this time. Great. And Bruce? Very friendly vote. Yes. Okay. Thank well, you. Bruce and Trim, yeah.
Good job. All right, so may I have a motion to move into a closed session? Um, I should have the little verbiage here, but I don't know. Do you want to adjourn this one since it was noticed separate? Okay, sure. Motion to adjourn? Second. Thank yep. you, Bob. A second? Yes. Thank you, Bruce. A motion to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, At 7.34 p.m., we adjourn. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then. Like a, like a mini size. Thank you, Bob. Butter, butter